Good morning, everybody. Um, if you were here yesterday, I went live and I baked, um, I had two loaves ready. I pre-shaped them, shaped them, got one into bake and one into cold proof. Um, I had some sound issues at the beginning of my live yesterday. I probably got about four or five minutes into the live before I realized that my sound had cut out. Um, so that live was actually a really good one. We covered lots of stuff, but the first few minutes of the live, um, you couldn't hear what I was saying. So hopefully everyone can hear me today um, and we're not having any sound issues. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm still a little sick. I've been sick for about a week. Um, so what I've got is bread that is cold proofed, um, but I made a few mistakes yesterday. I knew they were happening at the time, but I think this is a good opportunity to talk about what happens when we're trying to follow the essential processes, but something messes up. We mess up our mix or we mess up something in the recipe or our timing changes. Um, so yesterday, my dough was mixed by my nine-year-old stepdaughter. She is incredibly intelligent. She loves being in the kitchen. Um, she's gotten to the point now where she can pretty much mix the bread on her own. Um, she knows that we do the level two hydration recipe, so she knows it's 200 grams of starter, um, and then to tear the scale back to zero, and then put 700 grams of water in and whisk it up, and then put 1,000 grams of flour and 20 grams of salt on top. So yesterday I started to bake my bread. I didn't think she was gonna do it with me. I got the starter into the bowl and it was 210 grams, but I thought, ah, whatever, I just, it doesn't matter. So I don't think that it always has to be super duper accurate. So I had 210 grams of starter in the bowl and then she came over and said, let me do it. Um, and she was, she was pouring her water in and accidentally put 720 grams of water in. So we ended up with 10 grams of extra starter and 20 grams of extra water. It doesn't sound like a huge difference, but a 20 gram change in the amount of water that you use in your sourdough actually makes a big difference to hydration. That brought us up to 72% water hydration and 21% starter. Um, and I do believe that starter affects the hydration of your bread. I know people say, well, how could it? It's half flour, half water. But the reality is that once starter starts to ferment, um, it turns to more of a liquid than a solid, right? Because what it does is it eats through the flour and eventually turns to alcohol. So I think that starter definitely does affect the hydration of your bread. So long story so short, yesterday's dough that I mixed ended up being higher hydration than I normally do. I think that all-purpose flour is great up to about 70% hydration. And my mix yesterday was about 800 grams of all-purpose flour and 200 grams of spelt. Um, I really believe that if you're going to go more than 70% hydration, you need to um, go up to a sturdier flour. So maybe a bread flour um, or maybe a higher protein flour. So here's my starter. And when you look at that, even though it's technically just half flour and half water, it's actually more of a liquid than the flour and water that we're putting in, right? So I think that these things affect it. So yesterday I came on, I went live, I pre-shaped and shaped two doughs. I scored one right away, put it in the oven and put the other one into this Banneton basket to cold proof overnight. Normally I would let this dough cold proof a little longer because I still haven't even cut into the bread that I made yesterday. But when the bread came out of the oven, I could see that it hadn't really sprung very well in the oven, which means it was probably a little bit overproofed. Um, and so with cold proofing, if you leave the dough in the fridge too long, it just continues to proof, right? So if the dough was already proofed during the bulk proofing phase, the cold proofing phase is just going to magnify that. And this is why with beginners, we always suggest that maybe you skip cold proofing just for the first five or six loaves until you get used to the essential processes and then start adding it in. So what I'm gonna do today is I'm going to dump this dough out of the banneton and I'm going to get it scored and into the oven um, and get it um, baking. I'm going to check the score at 10 minutes after it's been in the oven for 10 minutes and I'm probably gonna recut that score to try and get this thing to oven spring. 
So if you have overproofed your dough, if you know you've overproofed your dough, and there's ways to know if your dough is really sticky, if it's not holding its shape, if it's falling, um, then there's a couple sort of last ditch efforts that you can make to try to, to get that bread to at least be okay. So my bread that came out of the oven yesterday was just okay. So after I get this into the oven, I'll cut into the bread that I made yesterday and show you. I can almost guarantee it's a little bit gummy inside. So these um, bannetons are pretty good. They're silicone. I like them. Um, they do have a tendency towards sticking a little bit when you're trying to dump the dough out of them. So what I usually do is start folding them because they're very flexible, like this. So I sort of push the dough out, and hopefully, I can see it's a little stuck, but hopefully this dough is just going to come out nicely. And then I'll just use my hands a little to get some good shape back in there. Yeah, see, it's a little stuck on the edge here, but we'll unstick it. If you use traditional bannetons with the linen liners, then you might have a better opportunity. But again, like I said, this dough I think is a little bit overproofed. And so that's going to contribute it to making it way more sticky. And so usually my bread is always perfect or close to perfect because I have a ton of experience and practice and I'm always baking. Um, but every once in a while things happen. And while this bread was being mixed, I could I could see and feel it happening. I knew that we put too much water in. I knew that we put too much starter in. We had to go out during the day. Um, and so that sort of made it proof longer than I would have liked it to have proved. So the dough's a little sticky, sticking to my hands, right? It didn't really hold its shape as well as I would have liked it to. So if I've cold proofed a dough and it comes out and doesn't want to hold its shape, there's nothing wrong with coaxing some shape and height back into the dough. What we want when we bake our bread is for it to spring upwards, right? So the whole idea of pre-shaping and shaping is trying to trap as much air into this bread that we can. So often, when my bread is fresh out of the bannetin, what I'll do is just go around the edges like you see me doing here and try to coax the bread underneath itself. So I'm not messing with the air, I'm not changing the shape of the bread essentially, but what I am doing is just sort of pushing the edges of the bread underneath itself and getting some of that, that shape back. I can just tell by the way this bread is acting that it's a little bit overproofed. Okay, so let's get this scored and get it in the oven. So while I'm getting this ready to score, and let me just move this so that maybe you can see a little better. Tilt this down like this. Um, so my oven has been preheating for about 45 minutes. Uh, my Dutch oven is in the oven. I've got a tray of water on the rack underneath the Dutch oven. That's just to try and keep the bottom of my loaf from getting too, you know, hard. Um, and I'll leave that tray of water in all the way up until about the last five minutes. I'm just going to put some basic scores on this. So you've got three types of scores with sourdough. You've got a, um, a functional score, which is the score that helps the steam to escape during um, your oven spring. You've got a aesthetic score, which is sort of the pretty ones that we love to see in photos. And then lastly, you've got a hot score, which is what I'm going to do today. So for this batard shape, I find that a straight up and down you know, half inch deep score times three or four is good. If you were just going to do one single functional score, then you're going to want your, your razor to be on an angle like this and make sure you really get in there nice and deep so that it has the ability to let the air come out. But since this spread has four different functional score lines, I find that having multiple score lines actually helps the bread to um, let the steam out in an even and uniform way. So my bread's not doing too bad, right? It's not a soupy mess. It's not falling per se. It is holding its score that I'm cutting into it. It's not just losing it right away. If your bread is severely overproofed, then that will happen. I'm just going to take my tiny little um, razor here and just put some pretty decorative lines on. So here I'll do like some... Um, wheat leaves on this one and maybe on this one. So these ones are just not deep 
these ones are just aesthetic, right? They're just to make the bread look pretty when it comes out. So I'll put those in, right? And then maybe I'll just put like X's on these ones. Yes, X them. And then these ones will just do angles on the edge. There we go. So that's nice and pretty, right? So what I'm going to do is get my Dutch oven out of the oven. I'm going to put this tin foil on the bottom of the Dutch oven. It goes under my parchment paper. Um, so the tray of water on the bottom rack underneath the Dutch oven and this tin foil serve to keep the bottom of my loaf from getting crunchy and too hard to cut. Um, and in a minute, I'm gonna cut into my bread so you'll see what I mean. So we're just gonna put the Dutch oven out, get the lid off. I'm going to use my parchment paper like a sling. Just pick it up, set it into the Dutch oven, and then get that lid back on and get this into the oven. Try not to burn your mascara off or your face. And then I'm going to just take my little timer and set it for 10 minutes. So 10 minutes in, I always check my my score, right? If if your score isn't working properly, just come with me. I'm just going to rinse my hands off while I wait. So what does a functional score do? A, a functional score allows the steam to escape from the bread during oven spring. So when you put your, uh, your bread in the oven, it needs to be at high temp. That high temp causes the bread, especially within a Dutch oven, but you can also do it with a loaf pan or whatever, causes the bread to build pressure on the inside. And that all that air that we've trapped in during pre-shaping and shaping starts to bubble inside the bread. And then ultimately, your one inch thick bread that just went in the oven gets this pop, right? Everything that's inside the bread kind of has this explosive reaction, and that's what we call oven spring. And the only way to get good oven spring is to have perfectly proofed bread. Um, so we always talk about the essential processes linked up in the description of this video. Um, there's a link to the new cold proofing video that I just posted on YouTube. There is also um, links to the beginner bread recipe and the essential processes ebook. So that sort of goes a deep dive into what's actually happening in sourdough, what's going on. And as we're going here, if you guys have any questions, type them into the comments. I'm happy to answer them. But basically we're looking for this great oven spring. And if our bread is overproofed or if we use too high of a hydration for the type of flour that we're using or whatever it may be, then we won't get oven spring. So when we see people with these discs, these flat, hard discs, what happened is their, their bread failed to spring. And usually the failure to spring happens early in the process. Usually you have overproofed your bread during the bulk proofing phase on the counter, and then possibly you've added cold proofing on top of it, which is just going to magnify the situation. So I'm just gonna show you guys, um, this is the loaf that I made yesterday live. One of the members in the group messaged me, and she, her, her farm is making these breads. They're really cool. I put a link to them. So she's about to launch these on Amazon. She messaged me and said, hey, can I post these in the group? And I said, you can post them in Sourdough Marketplace. But they're like lined with beeswax and they smell so good. And look, so my bread goes inside of it. So here's my loaf from yesterday. It's going to taste fine. It did get a nice ear, right? but it's a little bit flatter than I would really want my bread to be. I really like my bread to have this nice high dome. I'm always looking for about, I would say, what is that? Three and a half inches. And I'm probably, you know, it, it didn't get as high in the center and it didn't get as high on the sides as I'd like to see it. I do have a nice soft bottom. So I get that by putting the tray of water on the rack underneath the Dutch oven and the tin foil underneath the parchment. But when I made this bread yesterday, when I was getting it put in the oven, I could tell just by the way it felt while I was pre-shaping it and shaping it that it wasn't, it was falling too quickly. I pre-shaped it and usually if I pre-shape a dough, it'll sit there and it'll take a full 30 minutes to spread. It was starting to spread right away. So I could just see looking at it that it, it was overproofed and the hydration was high. So let's cut into this while we wait for the hot score on our other bread. So this was baked yesterday, it's fully cooled, 
as you can see, because of the fact that I keep my bottom soft. So there it is, gummy on the bottom. It's even gummy up through. So I'm hoping, so what happened was this bread did not spring. If I squish it, it's gonna pop back a little bit. Don't get me wrong, this is decent bread, right? Like this is totally edible bread, but it feels quite moist. It feels heavy to hold and it's quite gummy on the inside. So I knew that that was starting to happen when I, right at pre-shaping yesterday. And as you practice with sourdough, you'll get to know these feelings. And that's why we have um, the sourdough um, baker's playlist on our YouTube channel actually has all of these videos in order where you can go, okay, well, what's the beginner red re bread recipe? But as I'm learning, what issues am I going to encounter? So definitely go on YouTube. It's the same as Facebook at sourdough for beginners. And we've got those broken down, but I thought it would be a good idea to do a live. So my bread that is in the oven now is from this same recipe. This dough was mixed at the same, it was the same batch. I split it into two. I baked one right away and I, um, cold proof the other one in the fridge overnight. When I brought the cold proof one out, it had had a bit of a rise. Um, my husband thinks that part of the problem is that I hadn't, um, preheated my oven enough. So maybe the oven wasn't hot enough to get some spring. Um, can you, so Amber says, if you notice this happening, can you just back it and turn it right into focaccia bread? Okay. So if it's really overproofed, like you're trying to pre-shape it, it won't come together. So definitely watch the pre-shaping video on YouTube. Um, in the shorts, like I've got multiple pre-shaping videos. There's, there's a, I think even if you scroll down on the Facebook page, I just reposted one recently. If you're trying to pre-shape and it won't come together, then it might be a loss and turning it into focaccia is a really great thing to do. In most cases, if, if it's not that overproofed, if it's not super overproofed, you can save it. So like this bread, right? It's good bread right? It's got all the, all the right ingredients, right? It cooked up nice. It doesn't really have too many gaping holes, right? It's just a little gummy, right? And me, I'm sourdough for beginners. I've got 35,000 followers on Facebook and 700,000 members in my group and everybody's coming to me to learn, right? So for me, this is extremely disappointing because I really want my bread to be perfect all the time. But the reality is that sourdough is a finicky thing and any little tiny issue can cause a bread that would have been perfect yesterday to not be perfect today. Um, so I thought it was a good idea to come on and show this. So yes, if your dough is ruined, if you really overproofed it, um, bulk proofing. So we suggest that with bulk proofing, you, after you're done your stretches and folds, use a clear straight sided container like these. So split your dough, right? Exactly. You can't win them all. Even if you're, even if you literally bake sourdough every day. And I, I would say I bake sourdough six days a week, right? I just want to check my timer here. So we've got three minutes and then we're going to look at this hot score. Um, so if you bulk proof, Number one, skip cold proofing as a beginner until you get used to all of the other processes. You mix your dough, you stretch and fold it four times with 30 minutes rest in between. If you did the whole recipe, it makes two loaves or you can split the recipe right in half and make a single loaf. If you've got the two, split them, get them into clear straight sided containers, mark their height, wait for the dough to double, right? You want that dough to get to double its size. When you put it into these clear sided containers, it's not gonna be perfectly level, right? It's gonna be kind of a ball. So mark your height here, it might not be totally doubled, but over here on the corner, it might be like tripled, right? So we're still estimating, is this dough doubled or is it at 75 or 80% or 120? But at the same time, this is giving you a really good view. It also creates this consistency where you can go, okay, well, last time I baked my bread and I let it get to this line, and it was a little underproof, so I'm gonna let it go a little bit farther. Or last time I baked my bread and it was, you know, up here, and I found it was a little bit overproofed, so this time I'm gonna let it go a little bit shorter of a time. Some very popular recipes out there on the internet, if you just Google easy sourdough recipes, suggest that you should bulk proof your dough on the counter overnight. 95% um, of the time that is way, way too long. So this bread that is overproofed and gave me this gummy sort of scenario, 
had only sat on the counter for four and a half hours. I think that in most cases, your dough will proof enough in somewhere between four and eight hours. Um, so definitely consider doing the bulk proofing, um, that, that, that method that we use. And everywhere there's um, links to our video called Do This One Thing to Guarantee Bulk Proofing Success. So today what we're trying to do is save this dough or fix some of the issues that we know exist with this dough. We know that it's a little overproofed. We cold proofed it, so that might have overproofed it even more, right? So we've tipped it out of the banneton. We've pushed sh some shape back into it. Normally when you, um, when you put your dough into a banneton, it's not supposed to be touched again after that, right? You just tip it straight out of the banneton, score it and put it back in. But if you can see that the bread is falling or if it's stuck to the banneton, it's fine to try to reshape that bread a little bit. My alarm's gonna go off in about 20 seconds here. Do you auto lease before? I noticed lots of recipes skip this. I haven't and was wondering if it makes a big difference. Um, and Amber says I'm off topic. You're actually not off topic. Um, this is what we say. Simplify the process as a beginner. There's lots and lots, and the essential processes ebook is like 35 pages, and it tells you these are the essentials, these are the optional or advanced steps, right? Let's um, check this score, and then I'll go back into auto leasing and Levain's and um, all of these sort of more advanced processes. So let's just aim this here, and let's grab my handy dandy scoring tool. So what I'm looking for is whether or not my score line has started to fuse. So if you check your bread 10 minutes after starting to bake, your score lines will have either stayed open or started to fuse. If you look at this one, they're still open, right? So when a bread is overproofed, these score lines that you cut you can see it sort of on the end here. It's starting to get smooth, right? And we're only 10 minutes in. So that, and this one's starting to get smooth. These ones stayed open. So what you can do as a last ditch effort is just cut these score lines again, about 10 minutes in to try to keep the bread open long enough for it to be able to develop an ear and spring. It's not gonna make the bread perfect, right? But it is going to help, especially if you already suspect. So I'm just going to get this back in the oven. I've turned it now. So when it first went into the oven, it was facing this way. I've turned it. Every time I touch my bread in the oven, I rotate my Dutch oven. So that's back in there now. And now I'm going to um, set the timer for another 20 minutes. So there's a million different ways to bake your bread. Every oven is different. Um, so what that means is you have to find the right baking temp and time for your situation. Everyone always says, well, ha bake at 500 degrees for 20 minutes and then 450 for 20 minutes. And, but that's not the same for one person or another. Um, does it come together when it's underproof as well? Ginny's asking. It, underproofed bread, there's not a lot you can do to help an underproofed bread. It just simply hasn't done enough gluten structure development yet. So if you do find that you've baked a loaf and it's underproofed, your only real option is to bulk proof a little longer next time. Um, using the bulk proofing con containers, watch the bulk proofing success video in the baker's playlist, um, bread baker's playlist on YouTube. There's a video called Here's Why. Um, you should keep an eye on your, your dough while it's bulk proofing. It actually talks about like what happens. Underproof bread, there's not a lot you can do to save it other than perhaps proof it longer. Um, the problem with underproof bread is that you usually don't know it's underproofed until after you bake it. Doing that hot score, checking your bread 10 minutes in, it doesn't hurt anything, right? It doesn't hurt anything at all to pop your bread out and look at how that score is doing. Um, so you might as well do it every time you bake. I, I didn't, I never used to do it, but I've started doing it quite a lot. So and basic essential processes versus advanced or optional processes are things that we talk about all the time. So an auto lease is where you take the flour and the water that's in your recipe. So in our case, 700 grams of 
uh, water and a thousand grams of flour and mix them, just the two of them together and let it sit for quite a long time. Usually it's like some, some only call for an hour, but usually it's like four hours or eight hours or overnight. And what happens during an auto lease is the, the flour and water start fermenting exactly the same way that your starter would, right? If you made your own starter, then you might have found you mixed your flour and your water and on day or two or three, you saw this false rise, right? So it is something that is good, right? To auto-lease your, your flour, you're encouraging this great fermentation to happen and sourdough is entirely fermented bread, right? But it's a little bit more complicated than it needs to be when you're a beginner. When you're a beginner, you presumably don't necessarily understand all the processes. You haven't seen what happens when you do A or B. And when you're trying to figure out how to make bread, there's going to be failures, right? And if you've got less steps in there, if you've simplified the process, then there's less things to troubleshoot. And with the essential processes, mix, stretch and fold, bulk proof, right? Shape, pre-shape, shape, score, bake. It, it's only like that many steps, right? So it's e much easier for you to go, okay, I probably screwed up in the pre-shape phase, or I probably screwed up in the um, bulk proofing stage. So we say that things like an auto lease, and then what happens with an auto lease is then you add your starter and sort of knead the starter in, then you wait 30 minutes, then you add the salt and a little bit more water and get the salt in. It's a lot harder to get the salt evenly distributed. It's really something that takes a lot of experience in working with dough. So is it a great process? Yes. Do we think beginners should use it? No. That's all there is to it. What are some other ones? So we say cold proofing is optional. And the only reason we suggest um, skipping it as a beginner is just because if you've already made a, a mistake early in the process, cold proofing is probably just going to magnify it. So for me, I knew that my bread was overproofed yesterday. It was confirmed when my bread came out and hadn't really sprung very well and was quite gummy. So cold proofing this bread might have just made it worse. Now I am coaxing this bread quite a bit, right? Before I put it in the oven, I built some more shape and tension into it. I'm, I'm checking that score. I've got the oven as hot as I can possibly get it. Oh, sorry, we just started talking about baking. So the maximum that my oven goes to, my oven is a tiny little, I don't know if you can see, but like this is how big a normal oven's supposed to be and mine's like a six inches narrower. It's an apartment size oven. It's got no special features. We did a renovation during COVID and couldn't get appliances and said, oh, well, we'll just grab this for now. And then we'll, I mean, I've got these, I've got this big, beautiful hood fan and all these new cupboards and brand new flooring and beautiful counters. And then I ended up with this apartment size oven and I've never uh, replaced it. And now that I'm obsessed with bread and doing sourdough for beginners, I'm reluctant to buy an oven until I know exactly which one I want. I'm kind of leaning towards getting a Simply Bread oven, which will mean that I need to renovate this entire section again to make it fit. Um, so my oven goes to a maximum of 450 degrees. I don't have the option to do the 500 degree bake. So the 500 degree bake is preheat your Dutch oven at 500 degrees, get it as hot as it can possibly go, right? And then um, pull your Dutch oven out, put your bread in, pop the lid on, get it in there at 500 degrees, sometime into your bake, usually somewhere between 15 and 30 minutes, you're gonna turn that temperature down from 500 to somewhere between 425 and 450. At some point, you get the lid off your Dutch oven, then you finish cooking, right? For me, I don't have that option, so I just keep my oven at 450 degrees the whole time. My oven does not cook very evenly, so I put that tray of water on the bottom underneath my Dutch oven to keep my dough from getting too crispy on the bottom because my, um, my oven is way hotter on the bottom than anywhere else in the oven. I do 30 minutes with the lid on, and then I do about 25 minutes with the lid off, and then I use a thermometer to check the temperature. The best way to eliminate the question as a beginner of, did I cook it right? Did I bake it right? Was my bake good? Is to use a thermometer. And I just mean like an inexpensive like stick thermometer. I've got a list somewhere, maybe I'll post it in the comments, of um, stuff that I've collected on Amazon. 
Um, and all of it is focused on is focused on being inexpensive but functioning well. So it's got like the scale that I use, the Dutch ovens that I use. Um, it's got one of these. So in the comments of this video after it's over, I will paste um, that list. So I just wanted to come on live and talk about how things that we can do to um, to try to work with a bread that we know is screwed up. Thanks for sharing your experience and knowledge. I'm excited to get started on a sourdough adventure. I was gifted an active starter, but just had surgery, so put it in the fridge until I can get on my feet. I'm currently absorbing all your suggestions, advice, and teaching. I was hesitant, but you're greatly giving me the confidence that I will become a successful sourdough baker. Ah, I named my sourdough starter Sarah. Oh, I'm gonna cry. Thank you so much for that, Monica. I hope you feel better soon. Um, if it's gonna be much more than a week, just pop that starter out of the fridge once every seven days, discard it and feed it, it'll keep it happy. Um, but it can live in the fridge indefinitely. Um, you could probably leave it in the fridge for four to five weeks without um, feeding it and it would be revived. But if you're getting close, then do it that way. Um, Jenny says, does my starter need to double within six hours? I've had it double many days in a row, but not within six hours. Um, no, it's not about time. Sourdough is never about time. That's a good thing to learn is that sourdough is always about what you're seeing with your eyes and how the dough is and um, ingredients are acting. Jenny, as long as your starter is doubling consistently after every feed, so every single feed it doubles and every time it doubles, it's, it looks at the same and you know it doesn't smell too, uh, too heavy like alcohol, then I think you're good to go to bake. Um, and you can just time your feedings based on how long you know it's going to double. Barb, who's one of the admins in our group, um, has a fairly cold environment in the winter, and her starter takes 12 hours to double, but she still makes beautiful bread. So, no, it's not about time. It's more about consistency. Um, if you're just getting started, uh, the beginner bread recipe is definitely a good place to start. Um, lots of troubleshooting help. Now, in regards to these lives, every Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern, I've committed to going on and sitting and waiting for people to put their questions in. So um, at 7 p.m. Eastern, every Monday night, you have the opportunity to actually come in, use your phone, make a video, ask your question, show me your dough, you know what I mean? Whatever it may be, come in and get this sort of one-on-one -on -one help. I'm using an app called StarCam. So you do have to download the app. It's free, it doesn't cost anything. There is the ability within the live thing where I could like charge people to come in or you can send um, bits and stuff like that. But I, I just have them set up as free. So starcam.com forward slash app, type that in or just go on the app store um, and it's there. And once you get in there, you'll see that I'm set up for this Monday night. So if you're sort of just going through things or having some issues or whatever, definitely come on into that and ask those questions and listen to the questions that other people are asking. So I've got about 10 minutes left for my 30 minutes with the lid on. Then I'm going to do 20 or 25 minutes with the lid off and keep checking the dough until the temp hits 205. And once it comes out and has cooled, so I usually let my bread cool at least two to three hours, I'll cut into it and we'll see if it's any better than the one that we made yesterday. See if these measures that I've taken to try to help or fix an overproof dough worked. Um, so if you're watching this now or whatever it may be and you've got any questions, ask them in the comments. I always come back to the comments of these lives and follow up and I'll make a post later to show you um, how how this bread came out and hopefully we'll see you tomorrow night on Starkin. Talk to y'all soon. Bye.